Uh, one of the predicaments um, of content is obviously the issue of monetization. And this is really a cross-cutting issue, not just for individual uh, content creators, but also for media companies. I think we can see how many media organizations are struggling around content monetization, and especially in the context of, you know, sort of the digital first consumer world that we're operating in. So my goal today is really to give you a sense of the different ways and means you can use. I'll also share some personal anecdotes of how I've been doing it. And the funny thing is in a market like Kenya, you'll tend to find that some of the methods are not quite as robust or as mature as you might find, say, North America or Europe. And therefore, we find different ways of monetizing. And I'm hoping that at the end of the session, you'll have some new insights, but more importantly, some actionable steps uh, that you'll be able to take forward uh, in terms of your content monetization journey. That's quite a few things about me, but the most important thing on that slide is that I'm an Arsenal fan. And as you can imagine, we are waiting, we are hoping, our friends at Fulham today, where we have Alexi Wobi, yeah? Bird Lendo, and also William, our former gunners, might do the business. So for those in the room, this is the year, guys. Let's have faith. And for the Manchester United people in the room, tomorrow is going to be 5-0. Okay, 5-0 tomorrow, just remember. <laughs> I don't know, but I just have faith that Fulham is going to do the business today. So a little bit about myself from a content creation perspective. I've been blogging now for 17 years, if you can imagine that. Um, and uh, over there I get about 10,000 um, people every month and growing. I also concurrently run um, content on Medium, and this is really strange because initially I always thought when you're doing content, you know, keep it on your own proprietary platform. The funny thing is nowadays when I publish on Medium, my content comes out tops on search engines like Google more so than even my blog. And as you think about monetization, think about the fact that you want to disperse your content across platforms to increase the reach, visibility, and yes, opportunities to monetize. Because if you keep it on one proprietary platform, you might lose opportunities. On Twitter currently, I'm at 20,000. I crossed that threshold recently. Twitter for me has become an incredible platform for just content reach and engagement. Over the course of this week, I've been involved in quite a few events. It was a, a fintech event the last two days. Uh, we had a friend of mine uh, from Google who was doing a presentation, and that thing, I think, has gotten over 30,000 people looking at it. Uh, so again, when you think about monetization, um, the platforms are critical. Facebook, I have my personal and, and, and brand page. Uh, LinkedIn, for me, is incredibly important. That's probably the platform where I'm getting the most reach and engagement. And even when it comes to brand deals, where I'm doing reviews of technology products and services, it's actually because of my LinkedIn presence. Now, the beauty about this is saying basically that the same content could sit on four or five different platforms, but you'll find there's a different audiences and different stakeholders that want to work with you. So case in point is because of what I'm doing on LinkedIn, I recently did a review of a brand new LG TV. Uh, it costs about 300,000, so clearly I can't afford it. But this TV is incredible. But the reason they came to me because of LinkedIn, because of the people I speak to on LinkedIn. And in that audience, I'll tell you, everyone you look at when I look at my content, uh, my, my audience, are CEOs, you know, senior level managers and so forth. And that's the reason why uh, they want to use my LinkedIn profile for that. Um, also, newsletters, very, very important for content monetization. In many of these platforms today, you have an automatic embedded e-newsletter capability. And within that, you find that um, for um, LinkedIn, I have 20,000 followers. But on the newsletter alone, I have over 10,000 followers. So whatever I publish as an article, or what they call LinkedIn, um, uh, what do you call it, LinkedIn Pulse, automatically also gets distributed to that audience. And what that means is that that newsletter gives me opportunities for monetization, whether I put an ad in it, or the fact that the content could be sponsored by an advertiser. And then YouTube is kind of like my smallest one at the moment, in a way. I've been working very hard at it, and I'm just trying to get across to 3,000 to 1,000 uh, subscribers. Um, so far, so good. And then Instagram, small as well, 2,800. And the podcast is the newest thing. This is the one where uh, I think by next week we'll have our 100th uh, podcast uh, running on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all. Now, the reason I'm showing you all this is to show that as an individual or as a content creator or even as a media house, you need to have diversity of potential income streams. The more content you're able to disperse and sort of distribute across different platforms, 
the more opportunities you have for monetization. Because what you tend to find is that different stakeholders who find your content interesting and might want to participate with you in monetization might be looking at you for different reasons. So you find, for instance, on the podcast, there's very specific audiences or brands that come to me specifically to monetize their LinkedIn-specific people, Twitter-specific people. And from that point of view, then it means to say that if you're going to monetize digital content effectively, think of it as multiple income streams, almost like having different products across different platforms. So let's talk about what content monetization is, right? It's the strategic practice. Let me emphasize strategic. And you're going to see some examples here to understand how strategic this can be of generating revenue from content based in various formats, text, video, podcast, images. Another thing that you always want to do is make sure your content exists in different mediums and different formats. So typically, in the modern context, the most popular type of content has become the short form video. Often we call this the TikTokification of everything, where the attention span of the typical audience is now down to as little as 30 seconds, and you want to create these sort of snackable pieces of content that could be part of a larger piece of content, starting off with video. So that's sort of the apex content today, short form, easy to consume, regularly published. Then you have your longer form videos, typically YouTube and so forth. And then that same content can also be repurposed into text or written narrative in the form of things like blog posts. The same content can be repurposed as infographics, um, as podcasts, which are purely audio. So often when I publish on a platform like YouTube, you'll also get a Spotify audio of the same. And then, of course, things like images and graphics. It's pivotal in the digital ecosystem because, again, you cannot sustain content creation or content publishing without some form of monetization to underwrite the effort. And whether it's individuals or media houses, you know, we want to look at ways to sustain our digital presence today. And I can tell you for a fact that many media houses have not cracked this yet. Right? There are usually a few, um, can I call them apex brands like New York Times that have managed to figure this out. Uh, there's a range of different publishers who've sort of managed to do it well. Uh, but I can assure you many uh, media operations are struggling. And if you understand the different monetization methods and how to engage audiences, because remember it's almost like a chicken and egg scenario. Good content brings an audience. If the audience is consuming your content, you're able to make money through advertisers and other means. However, if you start to serve the master of revenue, there's a risk that you lose the very audience that brought people to your platforms. Okay? So finding that balance is also critical between content that's interesting and effective, but also making sure you're able to commercially uh, sustain it in a manner that actually makes sense. So who can monetize content, right? Um, it's not limited to just large influencers, right? Today we even have platforms that allow somebody with as little as two or 300 followers to actually monetize content, and we'll go through these in a moment. So the idea is that this is not a singular thing just for content creators or media. Um, they may be people or individuals who, in my experience, are not what you'd call the traditional influencer, but when they publish something on Facebook or Instagram, you'll see thousands and thousands of engagements. And they're not official influencers, but you find brands will approach them or a restaurant will reach out to them and say, hey, can you come and have dinner at our place, take a few photos and talk about it? So there's no limit to who can actually uh, monetize their content. We also have different types of content styles and personas. You have what you call the creator educator. So you're creating content with a specific view to educate people on a topic. You have the creator entertainer, which is sort of the more popular, more type of content we see locally on people using things like YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. You then also have the um, creator entrepreneurs, and this is a very interesting concept because what's happening is now that people who have managed to amass millions of followers are now literally building brick and mortar businesses on the back of their significant digital reach and engagement. Okay? And this is profound because what it's trying to say is that a content business can easily become a business in the real world if they have enough audience and more importantly, a context that allows their customers to feel that they can still purchase those products and services on the back of that. So the different models uh, that we're going to explore today um, in ways that you can uh, make money, so to speak. So advertising, where you place ads within your content. So this could be your blog post, your social media. It could be you speaking into that content. It could be an ad popping up at the top or the bottom. And this is sort of where, um, historically, a lot of uh, content creators have gone. Uh, you also find in advertising, uh, there are sort of endemic platforms like YouTube, uh, which are incredibly popular for monetization. Personally, I tried it in the past. It didn't work for me because I don't have the volumes or the numbers uh, in terms of views to sustain that. Um, you have subscriptions where people pay you a monthly subscription to consume content. 
typically premium content, right? So the idea is that there's public uh, accessible content, and then there's this sort of premium content behind the scenes stuff, which if your audience is really keen on who you are and what you have to say, they consider it to be valuable enough to pay for. And this is really good because what it then gives you is a sort of a consistent recurrent income. One of the challenges to content creation sometimes is that you have what I call feasts and famines. Today you have Samsung, you have you know, Safaricom and three brands working with you, and then for the next three months you have no customers, all right? So if you have a scenario where you want to just sort of make sure that you're monetizing your audience, um, subscription is one of the best ways to do. Affiliate marketing, where you get a commission on a product or service that is linked through your content, and usually you'll have what they call a, uh, a trackable link, and every time a, a, a commercial uh, transaction happens through that link, you earn a small commission. Now, in my experience, from what I've seen locally, this model is probably the least attractive because I've not yet seen anybody locally who can tell me with the fact that, you know, I have an Amazon affiliate thing and I'm making, you know, 20 million a month or a year. No, I just don't see it working locally. And that maybe has a lot more to do around the e-commerce culture and so forth. But it is yet another way of earning. And then you have community engagement where you create what they call uh, communities of interest. You know, it's almost like creating a mini social media just for the people who pay to be part of your collective and through that engagement, providing them a space where they can engage with each other, engage with you, uh, you're then able to sort of monetize that as well. Another type of content uh, monetization is licensing. And this is really interesting because I remember some years ago, something similar like this happened to me where I've been blogging about stuff, writing about stuff, and then one of the big telcos contacted me and actually said, listen, we really like your content. We've seen these five articles you wrote. Would you mind licensing this to us to use on our platforms? So they took content that I already created and literally paid me to license the content, slightly tweak it in a way that sounds in their voice and style and tone, and I was able to monetize content that I actually already created. And that's a very interesting concept where, you know, it's either something that you already did that they want to publish on their platforms, they pay you for that, or they commission you to sort of license content on their behalf. And again, this is a practice that seems to have a lot of currency of late because brands are sort of reaching a point of saying, hey, I want to talk to people and talk about interesting things that are not necessarily salesy or commercial, but I want to involve for advice and tips, for instance. So five things you need to know about the new data privacy laws in Kenya. You know, so a piece of content like that could be highly relevant to Safaricom. And they will pay you for that, knowing that it's sort of thought leadership content or educational content without necessarily a commercial agenda. And then you have the brand deals, where you partner with a brand to promote their products or services. This way you can become a brand ambassador, or like in many instances with influencers, they pay you to buy, you know, use a product or service, like I mentioned the LG TV the other day that I was reviewing. That's what we typically call a brand deal. And then non-content-based activities. Now in my experience, in my kind of work and what I do on content, I would say that the non-content-based activities are probably the most lucrative for me. And what this means is that the content almost acts as a top of funnel activity to create awareness and visibility. And as a result of that, somebody reaches out to you and says, hey, I've seen your content. I see what you're talking about. We have a, an assignment to build a website. We have an assignment to do some research. We have an assignment where we need you to hopefully come and speak at our conference. And as a result of that, that actually forms the bulk of my monetization. So the content almost acts as a funnel that brings people to me often for what I'd call offline activities, right? And this is a lot of work that I do, um, which is non-content based, but the content is the key that unlocks the revenue uh, with those activities. So remember, each activity requires a strategic approach. Think about audience size, entertainment or engagement level, content type, your capacity to produce content. Uh, nowadays, I have to even work with small video production consultants who help me create content of different types because it's usually a point where I can't do it myself completely. So if I need to go into an organization and do an interview with a CEO for my podcast, I'll need a camera crew, I'll need somebody to help me script it out. So now it becomes literally almost like a full TV production. Um, so understanding what capacity you need to build to do certain types of content is important because content just doesn't appear magically. You need to plan it, you need to know how it's gonna work and that's how then you can monetize it well. And again, if you sort of understand and work across these different platforms, you'll be able to get the most results. So what I'd like to do now is just sort of show you practical examples of people and brands and how they're monetizing content. And I think this is the first one, which is a house and uh, I think country and homes. It's a brand uh, from a company called Future PLC, which owns a whole bunch of publications and media. And what they do is they write articles or they create content of this nature. Um, 
and you will see that they'll say something like 12 wallpaper trends to have on your radar. Right? So right there, you'll find that within the content, they embed links, affiliate links, to the suppliers of those products. So that means, you know, if this was Daily Nation or any other media house, you're talking about this product or service or how to decorate your home. And then within the sort of recommendations, you'd see links saying, if you want to buy this or you want to consider this product, click here uh, to buy this product. You'll also see in Homes and Gardens, they also have the newsletter. Okay, so the newsletter is sort of pops up almost immediately. You come to the homepage and it asks you for your email address. And when you do put your email address, every time you receive that uh, email, guess what you'll see? You'll see brand sponsors, uh, such as the ones that were maybe seen in that article, also advertising in the newsletter. This is another one called uh, PC Gamer. It's also part of the uh, collective at uh, Future PLC. And you'll see from the beginning, you can see an ad at the top there, a very prominent ad, standard sort of Google ad. Um, they write a lot of reviews around different products. And within the reviews, you'll find links that actually connect you uh, to a, an opportunity to buy the, the product through affiliate. They too also have uh, the newsletters, uh, which allow you to also subscribe. And that becomes, again, yet another opportunity for monetization. And then you can see this is um, Architectural Digest, or what they call AD. Uh, AD have uh, a shopping platform built into their blog or website. Uh, AD also creates a lot of video content on YouTube and podcasts. Uh, and what you can see is very explicitly there's a shopping capability. And basically what they're doing is combining what we call content and commerce. Now, one of the biggest trends happening in media today is how media companies are sort of able to parlay the experience and the capabilities around content into actually selling products. So they almost act as a virtual storefront. They do a strategic partnership with a vendor, so maybe somebody like Carrefour or Naivas. And then on the back end, every time a, a sort of a sale happens through this, they earn a commission on that product. But to the user, it looks as if it was sold by Architectural Digest. And again, you can see as they sort of go through their various articles, you will find links uh, taking you to uh, different opportunities. Um, now, this is an interesting one, which is local. One of the biggest challenges we've had with monetization of, say, social media content in Kenya is that many of the platforms are actually skewed towards Europe, Asia, and North America. And quite often when you want to connect, let's say, your Twitter profile or your Facebook page to some of these monetization tools, they don't actually work in these regions. So Paid is interesting because this is a locally developed platform designed specifically for content creators or any other type of media who are then able to monetize through platforms like a WordPress account or uh, your social media platforms. It gives you a payment link, and you can then receive your M-Pesa or credit card payments through the same. Now, given that there are many, many, especially young people who are content creators in this country, probably in the hundreds of thousands these days, um, this is fantastic because it gives you a very simple way of monetizing uh, your content. It also allows you, if you have a website or a blog running on WordPress, you can connect it, and it gives you a way of uh, generating revenue. And you can see here the way you can receive uh, payments. They also have a wallet. You can see the commissions and sort of the rates uh, that they charge when you use paid. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, one of the big challenges we have in this region is that many platforms are not yet able to work locally. So this is from my um, Spotify dashboard. Spotify does not allow you locally to monetize through their platform. So our region is not yet covered. But you can see that within the Spotify environment for podcasting, you can use ads, subscriptions, donations, payouts. There's a myriad of ways in which you can actually generate revenue where it actually operates. But in most instances, for many of us podcasters, we do usually what I call a sponsored deal. You work with a brand, you work with an organization that wants to be on your podcast, and they pay you separately from any of these things. So you sort of monetize outside this platform. Another incredibly popular platform, and this is something that even Kenyan uh, content creators are using, is called Skillshare. Uh, Skillshare is a sort of a, uh, an opportunity to sort of use your knowledge and to monetize your knowledge by teaching people or educating people um, through your content. Um, and you can see there's different ways to go in. Um, this is interesting because this actually works locally and they are local providers who are on it. For me, one of the guys who's making a ridiculous amount of money on this platform is a guy called Ali Abdal. Maybe you've heard of him. He's one of the biggest um, um, YouTube content creators around productivity. He actually quit his job having been trained as a doctor at, I think, Cambridge or Oxford and decided to go 100% into content and productivity. 
You can see within this platform, it's got already 126,000 followers. You can see different master classes, you know, video editing. You can see how many students he has there. Uh, and this guy is just doing incredibly well. This guy has like, I think, 15 different money revenue streams uh, that he uses to create revenues. And in fact, he's got some videos where he's actually broken down how he makes cash as a content creator. I'd encourage you when you can, just Google uh, Ali Abdal, check out his videos around productivity, but more importantly, how he does his content monetization. It's absolutely incredible. I think he makes like, you know, maybe something like a million dollars a month just doing these different things. Another fantastic platform uh, is called Teachable. Uh, and Teachable is interesting because it lets you sort of uh, monetize in a number of different ways. So rather than going to three or four different platforms for different possibilities, it's telling you, look, you can be a sort of a content educator, uh, but within this space you can earn money in different ways. So first of all, it gives you a community tool. So just like you saw with Ali Abdal on Skillshare, he had like a community built into there. Um, so you can start to monetize on the basis of the community you have. Um, you can monetize on membership, so people paying you subscriptions um, to be able to see or consume exclusive content on your platforms. Um, it also has the capability for coaching. So if you, for instance, are a professionally trained coach or you want to coach people through your platform, you can actually go into Teachable and they'll help you also monetize from a coaching perspective. And then also digital downloads, where you create a digital product like an ebook. Uh, it could be uh, maybe a spreadsheet that people can use to maybe plan their personal finance or something. So if you have digital products, audio clips, videos, etc. Um, you can also monetize that through this particular dashboard. And it just goes to show that, you know, the amount of thought that has gone to creating a platform that's able to sort of help one account or one user monetize in probably four or five different ways. And then, of course, online courses, which is the, the key use case of their platform where uh, you create a uh, training program of some kind. Um, you know, it could be pottery, it could be how to sing, how to, you know, use a guitar. And that content then becomes yet another way of monetization. Going back to Ali Abdal, uh, he also has his own proprietary platform uh, called Productivity Lab. So again, this guy is the guru of productivity, how to get more out of your day, how to get more out of your work. So this is yet another of his sort of uh, monetization tools. And he's gone and actually built a platform that helps entrepreneurs, creators, and professionals to be more productive. So this is interesting because as much as he has uh, the platform on Skillshare, He's also built his own dedicated platform uh, specifically for helping people be more productive. And this is his own IP, his own platform, his own um, you know, way of monetizing the same. And you can see within the same that so far he's already helped you know, over 5,000 uh, creators and specifically in the area of how to improve or maximize your opportunities on YouTube. Now, personally, as I mentioned earlier, I've struggled on YouTube. I don't know what's going to happen, when it's going to really take off, because I put in a lot of effort. But, you know, clearly, you know, he saw that as a big problem for many people. And what he did is he created a tool or platform that helps people maximize um, the same. Coming back to Ali Abdal, this guy is just incredible. So this is his blog, okay? So you go to his blog, aliabdal.com. This is him. And you can see that within all of this as well, he's also written a New York Times bestseller called Feel Good Productivity. All right, and this is incredible because imagine every day he goes to sleep at night and he wakes up in the morning and chances are Amazon tells him today you earned $5,000. So this is the beauty of what we call, you know, creating content and then creating products, which then creates opportunities for what I call passive income. Money where you're sleeping, you're relaxing, you're driving the car, you're watching Arsenal, Hammer, Manchester United, and meanwhile money is coming into your bank account. Yeah, did you like that? I had to do the sound bite, yeah. And then he has an e-newsletter uh, called the Free Weekly Productivity Insights. So this is almost like a digest he sends out every week. And you can see already there, again, proprietary, uh, 275,000 people are his readers on the same. And even for me, when I was doing this exercise of creating this you know, presentation, I sort of started to get an unlock in terms of more ideas of how I could actually monetize uh, my content. Again, you go to Amazon, you can see his book is there. His book is doing very well. It's got over 2,000 reviews. You can consume it in a myriad of formats. What I'm surprised is that he doesn't have an audio book, but he's got Kindle, hardcover, paperback. Again, different formats for different audiences. Uh, and one of the things that I would say is that because many people today listen to podcasts and audiobooks, having an audiobook version of your content is absolutely important uh, if you've written a book. Because many of us no longer read books, we listen to books. Uh, so you want to make sure your content lives uh, in different mediums and formats, and of course, go to a place like Amazon, because what does Amazon do for you? That's important. Why is Amazon critical? Yeah.
Yes. So you can self-publish without having to go to a publisher. But there's something else that's critical about Amazon. Does anybody know where Amazon stacks up in terms of users globally? So here's the thing. A lot of people in the world use Amazon as a search engine. So after Google, after YouTube, Amazon is like number three. So when you're looking for stuff or information, it creates opportunities for discoverability. And if your content lives here versus doing it on your own Joakali, you know, publishing platform, you essentially are using it as a search engine to be found, but also to be monetized. So content discoverability is also super important. And Amazon does an incredible job of making sure people can surface your content. So think of it as a search engine as well as a monetization platform. So this is Ali Abdal again. I'll keep going on and on about this guy because he's just genius the way he does stuff. And you can see the way he's promoting his book there. Um, and of course, the different pieces of content that all tie up. Coming to our local market, uh, presumably you guys are familiar with Lynn Googie. Yeah, she does sort of podcasts. People sit on the couch, they tell their stories. Um, and, uh, you know, she's almost at a million followers. But what's interesting is that within her YouTube account, uh, you can see she has this uh, opportunity for you to become a member and you have different tiers of membership. So depending on what you're willing to pay, you know, you can spend uh, $2.49, then you have Ndovu Elephant, which is about $10 a month, Chui Leopard, which is $20, Kifaru Rhino, and then Simba Lion, which is $99 per month. And the beauty about this is each tier gives you a certain privilege or benefits uh, within her YouTube account. Um, so she's built an incredible following. She's probably making good money on advertising because most of her videos go to millions of you know, views. But yet within the same platform, she's got the opportunity to uh, use subscription uh, to drive uh, her content um, uh, monetization. And then we have Mr. Beast, uh, who, funny enough, I discovered through my children um, a few years ago. Uh, they watch this guy all the time. And in a way, I've become hooked on Mr. Beast because what I realized about his content is that it's a lot of feel good, you know, giving back to the world, you know, audacious challenges. It's just like really nice content. And uh, his story is incredible how he started and where he is today. Uh, but as you can see, he's one of the largest YouTubers in the world, you know, over 250 million people. Um, and he creates a whole bunch of interesting content. I think the last time I checked, I think YouTube pays him something like $54 million a year. That's away from brand deals. Eh? That's nothing to do with Samsung or Apple. That's just YouTube paying him $54 million. That means this guy's earning more than movie stars today. Now, what's interesting is that there's also something called the Mr. Beast uh, Burgers. This guy's literally created a chain of restaurants that now sell branded burgers in the real world and also does deliveries around his brand. So he's now moved from being a content creator to essentially a McDonald's or a Burger King using his brand. Now, of course, he works with partners to deliver the product. People who actually create the product, help him sort of figure out how to package it. And now he's in the business of actually in sort of the fast food industry. And you can see all the different types of uh, products he has there. You know, these are now his uh, colleagues who create content with him, who also have branded versions of their product within the same. So he's connecting that content to commerce, content to commerce as a way of monetization of the same. And then we have Marquez Brownlee. If you know anything about tech reviews, this guy is like the god of tech reviews. Um, started in his bedroom as a teenager. Today, I think, has almost 20 million followers on YouTube. And the other day, in fact, there was something so controversial about Marquez that he kind of trashed one of these new AI uh, assistant products. And literally, the company tanked because of his review saying that this is a horrible product. So he's reached a point where literally markets move on the back of what he says. And what's interesting about him is that apart from, of course, monetizing a lot on YouTube because he gets millions of views per video, he has an incredible business just on the back end around merchandise. So he has a shoe that he co-created with a manufacturer of shoes. He's got hoodies. He's got, you know, water bottles. And everything that you see there is really much an extension of his brand. Like he always talks about black, matte black everything. Like he loves, loves things that are in matte. And then it's always red and black and gray. So those are like his brand colors, and he brings them to the products that he creates. Again, we can see um, that's his, uh, when you land on his website, this is what you see uh, on his YouTube channel. Uh, these are the reviews that he creates. And then this is the shoe that he created. And when he did the launch of the shoes, it was kind of incredible because he worked with other influencers uh, to maximize the reach of his uh, content and understanding of the product. So these are guys now who've gone beyond content and now in the commerce space. They're really commercializing their content in different ways. 
Um, and here again, you can see other versions of his product. Remember, in most instances, they're not actually creating the product. They collaborate with the manufacturer, they co-brand it, they co-create it, and then now they work with them to actually sell the product. So, you know, and this guy is now essentially the fashion or the clothing business, so to speak. Coming back to home, uh, Jane Mokami, who I actually interviewed, I think it was late last year. Actually, I got on my podcast, which I thought was such a big win. Um, and Jane is an interesting story because she's sort of this fitness lifestyle coach now. And one of the things that Jane has done really well is that she's created content that then funnels people into her training and coaching programs. So if you check on her on Facebook, I think she has a group of women there, I think of over 100,000 Kenyan women. And these women believe in her. Like, they be, whatever she says, they go with. So she moved from being sort of a fitness entrepreneur to being a, a sort of a lifestyle and business coach. She's got ebooks which you can download from Amazon. She's monetizing that. But even more so, she has things like WhatsApp groups, Telegram groups. Um, she also has her Facebook groups where she's got like hundreds and thousands of Kenyan women following her tips around losing weight, living well, and so forth. Um, so again, she's sort of monetizing more offline rather than uh, through the actual content itself where her professional services and her coaching services are what people pay the most for. And then we have Biko Zulu. Uh, this was a bit of a surprise because I knew he had a book. I know that my wife was reading this with her book club the other day around called Drunk. Um, but Biko is kind of an interesting case locally in terms of how he's monetizing. Um, so what he's done is got like three different books which you can purchase from his blog directly. So somehow similar to Marquez Brown Lee. You can come in here and you pay with M-Pesa or credit card or whatever is your preference, you can purchase directly. But taking a step further is also his master classes. And I believe also, I think he might be working with you guys from time to time. So what he's doing is his training programs, he's now a creator um, entertainer, but also a creator educator, so to speak. And you can go in and subscribe and pay uh, for his master classes, which he holds periodically. Um, so that becomes yet another revenue stream and then this is sort of like the entry level of his one-on-ones or rather his master classes. And then he's also got the one-on-one -on -one mentorship where he doesn't provide a price. Uh, he just simply tells you, <laughs> get in touch. So I imagine the, the budget must be quite high. Because if you're working with him one-on-one, -on -one, there's no way it's gonna be 40K. I'd imagine it could be in the sort of multiples of hundreds of thousands of shillings. So in addition to obviously other stuff he does, like maybe I think he writes for Business Daily and other platforms, he's making money for both training and also the publications that he's put out. And then Jumia have their KOL program. So this is the only local influencer affiliate program I can think of that actually works. It's been around for a few years. I don't know how well it's working for content creators. I've never signed up. Um, but it's yet another opportunity where if you have a convergence between the content you create and products that are sold by Jumia, then you can actually sign up for this partner program and be able to then monetize content. Do you have a question? Uh-huh. Identify, yeah, yeah. Correct. That's how the affiliate programs work. Has it been good for you? Have you made good money? Mm. <laughs> Because you have to keep creating content and linking it up, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's, a, it's again a chicken and egg. The content has to be happening to have the links to commercialize, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I've never tried it. You know, again, I might be inspired to try it because I've been doing more and more electronics and stuff. Um, but it just goes to show that at least we have a local variant. So it doesn't have to be Amazon. It doesn't have to be uh, some of the other platforms that we're familiar with. And then you have um, Wowzy. Wowzy is an influencer platform. There are many, many in the world. Uh, I personally have worked with Wowzy a few times in a few engagements. Um, it's a good experience because it works with a mobile app. You connect it. It works with M-Pesa. Uh, and usually they'll either source um, uh, they'll either source you the business, meaning that if you have content and they want you to help promote a product or service, they'll reach out to you. Or it's sometimes in instances that hap had happened once, it was a client who told them please book Moses and put him on your platform, all right? So influencer platforms can be also be a very uh, great opportunity for you to monetize content. And then you have, of course, the Wowzy community and other factors. So they also try and support content creators to be more effective. 
Um, other ones are the Meta Audience Network, uh, which is an advertising uh, platform built into Meta. So that means Facebook, Instagram, and the likes, uh, which also allows you to earn money uh, through your content. Of course, Google AdSense, which has been around for many, many years. Um, I personally am not a big fan of this. When I first started blogging, I used to use it, and I think when I made a lot of money, it was like $50. Um, and just to say I was not inspired to continue. But more importantly, um, if you think about MKBHD, Mr. Beast, all those guys are making a hell of a lot of money there because they have so many views on their videos. Um, and then also, of course, for publishers like you know Daily Nation and so forth, you have publisher solutions if you're in the media or maybe you're a significantly big blog. Uh, you can also use that. They'll also help you automate your ads on the platform um, and basically maximize you know, things with ad optimization. Or one thing that Google does really well is when it comes to supporting um, content creators or publishers with content monetization, the tools and the things they've built are incredible. So it's usually very, very easy to onboard. But the bigger challenge is whether you have enough traffic to monetize to the extent that you could. Uh, this is Twitter. Um, or X, as it's called these days. Uh, and they also have a subscription program that you can sign up for, uh, where people can pay you for content. Uh, I signed up or registered for it a while ago. I'm still wait, it's still on pending. Maybe it's because they fired all the employees. Um, and then you have other types of ad revenue sharing and other programs. Now, for whatever reason, I mean, about 20,000 people had assumed they'd want me to be signed up, but for, it's, for some reason it's been pending like for months. Um, and you can see over here, that I've already checked the boxes for premium, so I pay the monthly subscription. I have you know, 20,000 followers, and then the last criteria seems to be five million impressions within the last um, three months. So that hasn't happened yet. Maybe that's the last trigger before I can start using Twitter for monetization, because I get a good amount of traffic there. And then like I mentioned earlier, Medium. Uh, Medium, again, if you're doing newsletters or articles, very, very powerful platform that you can use. Um, highly, highly recommend it. And one, for some reason, when it comes to search engine optimization, my medium posts outrank what I do on LinkedIn and outrank what I do on my proprietary blog. So I don't know what makes it do that, but I, I find it so incredibly important that I, I make medium one of my platforms. Currently, I have about 1,200 subscribers with my newsletter there. And that, for me, is pretty good in terms of it's just a place where I just publish content. So you can look at things like member read time, positive interactions, follower bonuses, boost bonus, uh, and you can see that if I wanted to sign up for the subscription options, you can see membership options there, which also give you opportunities to earn money uh, through their platform. Another publishing platform that I highly recommend is Substack. Now, this is huge because in America, what has happened and other more developed markets is uh, journalists and uh, media practitioners who have built a very substantial following independently and obviously through their positions in, you know, formerly CNN, formerly New York Times, formerly Washington Post, et cetera, uh, many of them have decided to literally leave working for media houses and have become independent media practitioners and they're using platforms like Substack to run their businesses. And the beauty thing about Substack is that it actually gives you the opportunity to do blogging, it has a podcasting capability, you can even upload videos, you know, a la, you know, YouTube style, uh, and you can commercialize your content in there. And I think it's brilliant because if somebody wants to be an independent journalist and, and monetize, then Substack actually could be a viable option for you, as we're seeing in North America. And within the same, sorry? <coughs> sorry? Substack. Yeah, Substack. Um, and also as a publishing platform, it's pretty uh, user-friendly, easy to publish. And even your, like my, my podcast, I'm able to connect it directly to my Substack, so the content can be pulled in automatically into my Substack as well. And then, again, this is where the challenges come in. So it works with Stripe. Stripe is not officially available in Africa, although Stripe owns um, a company from Nigeria called Paystack, which operates in markets like Kenya and Nigeria. So I believe possibly through the Paystack relationship you can connect it, uh, but that's very important obviously for you to receive money and you can get subscriptions at different tiers. You can also have like pledges or donations being sent to you uh, and so forth. Another one is Patreon, maybe you've heard of it before. Uh, many content creators today when they create a community or a platform where they engage with their stakeholders, they use Patreon. Um, it's probably the cleaner one. There's another one called OnlyFans. Um, let's just say, <laughs> I was trying to get a clean screenshot of that one, but I kept seeing things that I didn't want to see. So anyway, uh, Patreon seems to be a little bit more concerned around the nature of the content that you would see there. Um, so I would also recommend Patreon. 
And then this is my own blog. And what I've done on my blog is that I write my articles and stuff. The other day I was hating on Showmax. Uh, I think it's completely messed up these days. Um, but then that's just a content that gets traffic, by the way. And what I've done is you can see my company has banners at the top and the bottom. So if you'd like to pay, I'm just letting you know my company doesn't pay me for those ads. But if you want to buy spots, we can talk. Eh? Um, but basically, you can also use your own platform and then sell banner ads uh, within your own uh, platforms and monetize. And the amazing thing about this is that when I check the traffic, people are clicking. And I've actually seen conversions coming all the way through to a lead that comes to the business because of those ads. So it actually works. Um, lastly, uh, we have Mighty. Uh, Mighty Networks is yet another community-focused um, uh, platform that you can use for monetization. Um, and quite similar to Teachable, it gives you a variety of ways of monetizing. So this is another one that you can also explore uh, if you want to use Money Networks, uh, Mighty Networks. So we've kind of touched on the different platforms. Uh, we've talked about YouTube kind of being one of the most popular. There's Twitch. If you know anything about online gaming, people nowadays pay to watch people play games. I've never understood that, but my son is one of the people who does that. I don't get it, but they enjoy it for some reason. Uh, Patreon, which we've seen with different types of uh, memberships and subscriptions um, that you can have there. Substack, which I've shown you. Affiliate marketing, I've shown you. And again, each platform has slightly unique approaches depending on how it works. Yeah? But in most instances, what you want to do is use as many as you can, see what's working for you. Because when you aggregate the revenue across all these different platforms, the idea is that hopefully it should be significant enough. When it comes to selling products, you can also sell your digital products like we saw. You can use platforms like you know, Amazon and uh, Spotify. You can have your t-shirts, mugs, and so forth. Shopify and WooCommerce, and of course paid, which works locally if you have a WooCommerce website on WordPress. Um, you also want to look at making sure that the quality of the product is aligned. I remember some years ago, I think it was Samsung or Oppo was working with influencers. And back in the day, I don't know if it still works this way, but if you're on Twitter, it usually would tell you what device you use to post the updates. And our very clever, very commercially driven uh, Kenyan influencers um, were posting Oppo or Samsung updates using iPhones. So it said <coughs> over there, wow, I'm enjoying my new Oppo, my new Samsung. And then at the bottom, you'd see a message saying sent from iPhone. So why am I saying that's important? Because if you're going to do brand deals and things like this, for heaven's sake, be authentic. It's not just about the money, but hopefully you're actually using the product. And you know, therefore, um, you want to make sure there's that alignment uh, from there. And again, an audience of even a few thousand can make a difference. I remember for the time when I interviewed Jane Mukami on my podcast, you can go and listen or watch it. Uh, she told me the tipping point for her when she left corporate employment was when she put out, I think, that ebook I showed you. She published it to those WhatsApp groups and Facebook groups and all that she had. And then I think within a week, she had something like $100,000 in the bank. So she said to herself, hang on, you mean in one week, I publish this content, I send this book out, and I have $100,000 in the bank, more money than I'm making probably in six months in my employment. And for her, that was the moment they said, you know what, I'm leaving my job. You know, she told her parents, I'm leaving, I'm starting a new job. So for me, that's interesting because you know, she doesn't have like Mr. Beast numbers. But I think for any one of us, if we <laughs> created a book and we had enough of an audience and a following on our content and we made $100,000, this today I think is what? Is that 15 million shillings? Um, I don't think I'd be complaining, right? So it's sometimes, sometimes it's not the, the huge size of numbers, it's that. The other thing you can also have is that maybe like in the training like you saw with Biko, you know, if you say that I have a master class for only 10 people, but it's 200,000 bob each. So you don't necessarily have to have crazy numbers, but you can say, look, I have 20 people, there are 20 slots, it's 200K. If you want to learn how to write well, you know, join me. If you can't afford it, too bad. And you find that there are people also making money in that manner. They're not necessarily looking for 100,000 followers, but they have you know, 10 followers who are willing to pay 200K, and that's two, two million shillings in revenue, right? Affiliate marketing, which we've talked about, um, again, across Jumia, Amazon, Commission Junction, et cetera. Um, and again, you want to make sure there's a strong alignment between the content you're creating, your confidence in the products you're promoting, and of course, uh, how that then becomes um, a commercial opportunity. Uh, content licensing, where you can actually sell content to other parties. If you write well, they'll pay you for the privilege to use your content. The only caveat is that um, you want to make sure you retain some level of control, because remember, it's still intellectual property, even if you license it. So you might want to talk to a lawyer 
or consult some internet resources to make sure that you know it's not like you've given it away completely. You're simply licensing the content, almost the way we talk about model release when you use someone's picture in uh, promotions and campaigns. You might say for only six months, um, can only be used on digital versus billboards and there and so forth. Otherwise, you know, you know, in those instances, I have seen it just happen recently to a former client. They use somebody's <laughs> IP without permission, but luckily there was a good agreement and now they have to pay him, I think, 1.5 billion bob uh, for using his picture on a billboard without consent. So again, as you license content, um, make sure you do the paperwork so that you know you're not put in a situation where uh, you could be compromised. Uh, brand deals and content sponsorship. For me, I think the bulk of individual content creators in Kenya and Africa are doing this. This is where the bulk of the revenue is made. If you're gonna depend on YouTube ads and so forth, I guarantee you'll be poor. But if you're talking directly to Samsung, you're talking directly to you know, different brands that want to work with you on your content, that's where the most of the money is made. Um, in my experience. Uh, and again, make sure that there's a natural fit. You know, you don't have a situation like I remember, was it Karen Mutoko some years ago? She was doing a review of her phone and she started talking about the camera having megabytes instead of megapixels. <laughs> so you want to be careful that you are in the right place at the right time and you have authority in that space. Uh, don't do it just for the money and then end up looking bad. Eh? Um, advertising, again, Big source, especially for the biggest YouTubers and the likes. Um, you can have different ad formats. Uh, one of the biggest caveats in this area on YouTube is our YouTube shorts. They get millions of views, they get a lot of traffic, but guess what, the thing is 30 seconds. And Google will only compensate you on the views based on duration. So you're getting all this traffic, but guess what, you're getting very little money, all right? So this is one of the bones of contention in YouTube in terms of, you know, yes, and even in TikTok, short form content is popular, but it's hard to monetize. Okay, um, and really finding the sort of balance between advertising and content monetization is also critical in the sense that you don't want to get to a point where every post on your content looks commercial. You want to have some element of organic content that you're creating out of love and passion and enjoyment and for your audience. And maybe you say, fine, my content formula is gonna be, you know, two non-commercial, one commercial, or three non-commercial, one commercial. Because after a while, the audience will start to notice this guy is getting paid. He's not talking about the things he used to, they're now all about the money. So you need to find that balance so that if you end up becoming too commercial, you then start to lose your audience over time. Yeah, so this is something that you need to, to sort of pay attention to. The other way around that is just make sure that the, when you embed a promotional element, it doesn't come across as being so overt. It can be very subtle, it can be sort of more natural. Um, and then subscriptions, again, the best thing about them is recurrent revenue. The fact that every month there's money in the bank. Um, recurrent income is so important if you can find a way of making it happen. And of course, it means that it's an always on activity. You need to be literally giving value each and every day to keep subscriptions running. Because people will not pay your subscription if they wake up and think, huh, I'm paying so much money and nothing is happening. I'm not seeing good content. So the pressure here is that you literally have to be always on um, because the audience expects you to constantly deliver value. So that's the thing that I think you need to think about if subscription revenue is something that you're considering. And then of course, building digital communities. Again, very important today in the content context. You can create it individually, like we saw Ali Abdal, or you can create it on third party platforms. You want a place where, you know, it's almost like your own mini social media platform. Um, we're already giving so much money to the Facebooks and the Googles of the world. So if you have a chance to create your own dedicated platform and you sort of own that audience, uh, it's important. You can see even Ali Abdal, what he's done, He's going to build these communities of interest. You know, Jay Mukami has hundreds of thousands of Kenyan women on various platforms as part of a community. So that becomes a way of sort of holding your audience into sort of a proprietary space and uh, giving you a yet another opportunity to monetize uh, that. But effective community management means that, again, you're not just pushing content to them, you're actually having a relationship with them. So community management also becomes a key component of always on engagement. Because again, they're in the community because they expect you to sort of have a relationship with them. So, um, so best practices, what makes sense? Um, it's underpinned by, first of all, deep audience understanding. When you start to create content or whether you're a media house or content creator, you need to know who you're talking to. Where are they, what are their interests, what are their pain points? How do you bring value into their life? For me, the way I do it is I talk about tech, I talk about digital things, I talk about stuff around predominantly the digital space, which is my area of expertise and what I do day to day. So for many people, they see me as, you know, the audience I attract, 
think of me as somebody who knows what he's talking about technology. They'll say this TV is good or that TV is bad. Or like last night when I was trashing Showmax, you know, they'll look at it and tell you, yeah, yeah, I believe you, I trust you, I think you're saying the right thing. Um, creators and media should focus on content that resonates. You know, don't create content for yourself, create it for the audience, create it for the community. That's so important uh, because that's why they keep coming back. Uh, market trends and aligned with market monetization efforts. One of the things we see is that this is a constant uh, moving target. So there'll always be different ways of monetizing uh, your content. Just always stay on the pulse, try do experiments, try do different things. One of the things I'm trying to sort of consider doing soon is having a Twitter space or an X space and see whether I can monetize that. I've never done it before. I see on LinkedIn people are running uh, discussion forums and you know conversation areas similar to Twitter spaces. So there's a lot of ways and means that you can try and experiment and try and see whether you can create additional uh, monetization opportunities. Content challenges and ethical considerations. Um, so things like over commercialization, like I mentioned before, that can alienate your audience. Um, also making sure that efforts don't, uh, you know, compromise the authenticity or quality of content. Uh, being transparent, especially when if something is sponsored, you want to say, yes, I've been paid or I'm doing this as a partnership with Samsung. And maybe if you bought the product yourself, listen, these guys did not pay me, I bought it myself and this is what I'm telling you about it. So being honest about how uh, you've come across that product and how you're doing it is also important. Um, and then also, you know, monetization should not supersede uh, the content agenda in itself. You know, it becomes a chicken and egg scenario. So next steps, um, with a comprehensive understanding of the various uh, opportunities and strategies in the same, um, you can be well prepared to implement many of these methods. And really right now, I'll be open to any questions or clarifications uh, that you may have. Thank you very much.